Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, July 17th, and this is the weekly market update. The obligatory disclaimer, nothing you hear on this podcast or see on this video is to be taken as investment advice. I am not a financial planner. I am not an accountant. I'm not an attorney. I do not know your personal financial situation. Please do your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Okay, so let's get into the reality check this week. Um, this is a tweet that was in my Twitter feed this, this week or late this week. Um, I do not know this individual. This individual follows me on Twitter. And this kind of goes back to what I was saying last week. And this is, I want to talk about this. So let's look at this tweet. Hi, Uranium community. Can someone please be kind enough to explain what going on, what is going on in the Uranium equities? Thought the fundamentals are intact, and I did not hear of another Three Mile Island or Fukushima on the news. Complete carnage. Hope we don't see 2017 lows again. Thanks for your insight. So a, a couple things here. I, like I said, I don't know this person. I don't know if this person listens to these videos. I didn't respond to this person, but this is pretty typical of what we see in a lot of these speculative markets. Um, this person obviously doesn't know why they bought uranium stocks. They probably bought them because there was a lot of, you know, activity on Twitter. They were reading a lot of people, people were making money and basically uranium stocks were going up. That's why they bought them more than likely. Um, can this person, tell me how many actual reactors are operating in the world. Can this person tell me how many reactors are currently under construction and in what countries? Can this person tell me what the planning of future reactors is and what that means for uranium demand? Can this person tell me when the last uranium mine came online and how big it is and how many uranium mines have become exhausted and have went offline? Uh, how many uranium mines are being planned to be brought into production over the next three to five years? If this person could answer these questions, then they wouldn't have to be reaching out to strangers on Twitter to understand why uranium stocks went down. Uranium stocks went down because most of them do not have any revenue and they have no prospects for any near-term revenue. This is why they are speculative. As I have said before, there's probably only one investable uranium stock, and that's Kaz Adamprom. Cameco is even speculative at this point or fairly spec between speculative and investable. The rest of the stocks are speculations, guys. And a speculation is going to mostly be influenced by sediment and liquidity. And the liquidity will come from the sediment. The sediment was very bullish. Let's go to this next chart just so I can reference it while I'm talking to you. So this is the um, North Shore Uranium ETF. As you can see, Back uh, late last year is when this run in uranium stocks began. And if you gauge it by the, by the price action in this particular fund, you've been up over, you know, you've at least had a, uh, almost been up three times, okay? You've doubled and you, you almost went up three times in the stock. And now, you know, with very little pullbacks and you've seen the technically... The 50-day was trading above the 200-day. The 200-day is in ascent. The 50-day now has been growing its gap between the 200-day. And so these things have gotten ahead of themselves. The sediment became very, very bullish, and the fundamentals just didn't keep up. There hasn't been a lot of movement in uranium prices. We haven't heard of any major contracting happen, happening, okay? And so... Um, the sediment now has begun to shift. The shiny object has become dull and the Johnny come lately's and the people that really don't have a thesis or don't have, didn't do their research or don't understand why they put money into this, except for somebody on Twitter or on a discord channel or a Reddit channel told me to do this because it's going up. That's what happens in these speculative markets. I, I can't give you conviction. Uranium Insider can't give you conviction. We can give you ideas. We can report the news. We can lay out our thesis. You, it's up to you 
to understand it and see if it's, you know, something that your risk tolerance will allow you to put money into. People have DM'd me. Am I worried? No, I'm not worried. I don't have all of my money in uranium stocks. This is one of many positions. And if it went to zero, it wouldn't wipe me out. But I feel, still feel the risk reward is very, very good long term. So I'm sitting here, I have build, been building cash. And I'm going to watch this. Uh, this. This price action right now is very oversold. I don't show the um, uh, relative strength or the uh, MACD. But you know, technically, this is very weak now. You're basically flushing out all the Johnny come latelys. All the tourists are getting flushed out now. They're selling and disavowing uranium stocks because they never knew why they got them before. Because like I said, these are speculative stocks. So they're going to range all over the place because their fundamentals are not only based on a speculation of the, what's going to happen in the future. They're not investable. They don't have any revenue or earnings. We've talked about this many times. Many people get it. Most people don't. And so they get FOMO, they get visions of sugar plums in their eyes, they get pumped up by all the activity on these different, on the internet, and then they just throw their money in. And typically this happens near the top, and then they get blown out. We've seen it happen in, you know, same thing happen in cryptocurrencies that are now going down. This is what happens in speculative assets. So yes, I don't think anything's changed fundamentally. Uh, since I've had this channel, I've been talking about the positive fundamentals in the uranium sector. But I've also said that it's very speculative. And I've said consistently that the safest thing for you to do is buy physical uranium. But people don't want that because it doesn't have enough torque. It doesn't have enough action for them. Okay. So if the price of uranium goes from 30 to 60, you have 100% gain over the next couple of years. That's not good enough. They want, they, they've heard about, you know, the 10 to ones, the 20 to ones, the 100 to ones. That's what they want. And those are going to happen. But like I pointed out last week, when Forsyth went from, you know, 25 cents to $9 or whatever it was, I pointed out, it had three or four. 50% plus drawdowns on the way to that over a three year period. So what makes you think this one's going to be any different? All these speculative markets are like this guys. And so what you should do is I would be looking to see if this thing flushes out and what happens is as the prices of these things move towards their 200 day moving averages. If it blows through the 200 day, I'd, I'd still wait. Can it go all the way back down? Anything's possible in these markets guys. Anything's possible. This is such a thinly traded market. There's not, the, the total market cap is not that large and sediment has now become negative. You know, the Sprott uh, deal was, was going to be the big, you know, catalyst and that's eventually going to happen, but that's going to be one, another brick in the wall of a, of the uranium fundamentals longer term. This, we've said this before, this is a multi-year deal here. This is not something that's going to happen in three to six months. And we've, you have to be patient. And so what do you need to do? You need to have cash and accumulate cash. And when this thing will eventually bottom somewhere, I don't know, the first place I'm looking is, you know, just particular to this particular ETF, which as I said, most of you should be, this is what you should be using as your vehicle. But people want, like I said, want the hundred to ones. The first place I'm looking is for this to get down to here. And I want to see this 50 day start closing this gap. It's trading way too too high above the 200 day. And this is pretty typical of all markets. This is how they do it. You can look at any stock that had a multi-year run and drawdowns of 30 to 50% are pretty typical. And we've talked about this. We've talked about the drawdowns in Amazon. Nobody rode, very few people, Bezos himself, because he was the majority stockholder, went through several 90% drawdowns. Nobody, I remember when it first 1998, 99, 2000, uh, the thing wasn't earning any money during the tech wreck. And a lot of people were saying Amazon was going to go out of business. It didn't have any cash flow. And look at it today. You can't know the future. All you can do is try to calculate odds and probabilities and then commit capital based on when you think the probabilities are in your favor. But there's no certainties or guarantees. And like I said, if you want to go back and just use rational thinking, most people should not be in this market. It's too speculative for them. They don't, they can't handle the volatility. And uh, 
this is what happens. They'll dis they'll sell, they'll disavow, and then you know eventually this will turn and go move higher. Uh, I still think the fundamentals, like I said before, are very positive longer term. I don't know the timing. I can't know that. I can't know for certain the future. All I can say is that the ship is going in the right direction. Nothing has changed fundamentally. But you know, if you don't understand these things, if you don't understand that companies that don't have any revenues and earnings and subsist on stock issuances um, and, and storytelling, I mean, that's, that, that's speculation, guys. That's not investing. I mean, we can take Kaz Adam Prom's revenue, earnings, and cash flow and put a multiple on it and say, well, yes, it's overvalued or it's undervalued. Like I said, it's the only vi viable business model in this industry right now, currently. That's apt to change over the future. But these things are not investments. And so this is an example of what I was talking about last week. And this is, you know, it's unfortunate that people don't learn, they don't listen. They don't take it upon themselves to educate themselves. And they're just, you know, they're not even speculating. I mean, you talk about investing, they're not doing that. They're not speculating. They're just gambling. It's red or black on a roulette wheel. They don't have a clue. And I don't want to hurt, hurt anybody's feelings. I don't want to attack this particular person, but this is, this is pretty instructive, guys, of what, what it, things are happening. Am I nervous? I don't even look at this thing. I mean, the only reason I knew uranium stocks were going down is because I saw it on a Twitter feed and I looked at this, Okay. I'm concentrated on other things in my life. It's summer. There's a whole bunch of other things going on, you know, and this doesn't represent my whole portfolio. So I think if you called up, you know, Segra Capital that are big uranium guys down here in Texas that have been investing, or you get Mike Alkin on the phone if you're a limited partner in his fund, they're not worried. I mean, this is what happens in these markets. They have pullbacks. You flush out the uh, low conviction people, and then you know you find a base and it moves higher. The fundamentals, every day that goes by, the fundamentals continue to get better. This is an industry in liquidation. What do I mean by that? There's no new uranium supply coming online in any time frame that's going to be able to deal with the supply that the reactors are going to need over the same time frame. Over the next 10, 20 years, uh, there just isn't going to be enough supply. Now, I can't tell you what's going to happen in three to six months or over a period of a couple months, like right here, this stuff happens. This could go all the way. I mean, you could go all the way back down. You could have a 66%. You know, what's half off this, 35? You know, you could get down to here. I don't know what's going to happen. That would be in a tremendous buying opportunity. You know, if you bought here or if you bought here, the fundamentals are better now on the calendar than they were here. They just continue to get better. The price in the short term, okay, uh, is a voting machine. And in the long term, it's a weighing machine. The value will out. And we'll talk about that in the oil market in a slide that's later on. Okay. So talking about another valuation model, Peter Lynch, I saw this and I've been studying Peter Lynch recently, very successful guy in the Magellan Fund at Fidelity. And this is Peter Lynch's rule of 20 valuation method. So basically the rule of 20 is the S&P 500 trailing PE plus year over year CPI to get, and then you see uh, this model that they created that goes back to 1955 to show when things are expensive and when they're cheap. And this has been a pretty good, uh, I mean, this is 2000, the tech bubble. And you were way above, I don't know how many standard deviations above the, um, top of the range and being expensive. And you saw what happened after that. Okay. You've got markets correct to the mean and when they're overvalued or undervalued, they swing past and go the other way. And that's what happened. You got back to, you know, reasonable value. And then you went down uh, and created a situation where you were, you know, 2008 when you blew this whole thing out. Okay. And then you recover. We were undervalued and then you've moved higher. Now look where we're at here. This is like unprecedented based on this model. These are alarm bells for the general market, okay? When the market goes down, be advised that 90% of the stocks will go down, even the stocks that we're talking about, okay? Uh, but we have seen that when these overall market or growth, if you will, underperforms, value overperforms. So I just wanted to point this out because we keep seeing more and more of these valuation metrics that are pretty consistent across the board that they're not only 
showing things being overvalued or expensive, they're like way above anything they've ever been before. It's like screaming at us, overvaluation. And so you have this view, I think, that, you know, um, you know, there's nowhere else to go. Uh, you know, Tina, there is no alternative. I think people are going to learn a valuable lesson about valuation over the next couple of years. And it's going to be painful for many. And many people won't be able to afford the lesson. I mean, there's people that have talked to me that are older people. Mentioning it just in passing, when I talk to them, well, I'm in the market, but I'm nervous about it, but I can't, there's no, I can't get any interest on CD. So I feel like any, I mean, this is going to be horrible for a lot of people. A lot of people are going to get wiped out and they're not going to have any alternative. And that's why I think, you know, what I've said before, when this thing reverts to the mean and swings past it, so many people are going to get wrecked. So you're going to have, you know, over the space of 20 years, three major train wrecks, the tech bubble, you know, back here where a lot of people got wiped out. And then, you know, the housing bubble in 2008, nine people got wiped out and now the bubble of all time. And, you know, at some point, you know, I think the bull market and confidence in government and government institutions like the Fed, like the, the CDC, like all institutions and the media is going to collapse once and for all. And personally, I applaud it. I think it will be great for humankind and civilization longer term. But in the short term, many people are going to get destroyed. I caution you to take heed of these warnings. Pay attention to history. It matters. It's not different this time. Human nature does not change. The circumstances might change a little bit, but people react the same throughout the ages because the same elements of fear, greed, they're, 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 that doesn't change. Okay, so what happened to the inflation trade? Um, so I thought this was a great, uh, this was another tweet, uh, a guy uh, on Twitter that I follow. And I like what he said here, a couple of the points I agree with. Um, let's, let's see what happened, because we've had a pullback since June, right? So it's, uh, things have come off the boil, um, the froth. I mean, I think that everybody was long inflation, if you will. Uh, we were going to go into you know, hyperinflation. People started talking big. This is what happens, right? Sediment swings back and forth, okay, based on what's happening in the news. And then money, liquidity, there's so much liquidity in the market, that liquidity is flowing back and forth in huge waves. And so that's come off recently. So what's happened? The Fed has successfully jawboned all reflation trades despite doing very little. You know, uh, that's, you know, two little dots on a non-significant dot plot moved. And all of a sudden, you know, we're supposed to, you know, everything's going to unwind. I mean, it's, it's fascinating that so many people still have such confidence in these ridiculous people at the Federal Reserve and in the government. And like I said, you know, earlier, I think that confidence and that, uh, that in these institutions uh, is going to break. That's probably, you know, people say that the bond market's the biggest bubble. I think the biggest bubble is confidence in these institutions uh, that we have uh, unfortunately put our faith into. You know, we're dealing with fallible people that have different incentives and that have, you know, the same faults that we have. And yet we put them up as angels that are going to magically, you know, fix everything. As I've said before, this kind of segues into just a little spiel that I always give. You're responsible for yourself. No one cares about you. Like I said before, maybe your mother does if you're lucky. And that's not even certain for everybody. If, you know, you have to take control as much as you can of your own life, whether it's financial, health-wise, whatever, you cannot rely on these people because they are doing things for their own motivations, not yours. And incentives matter. I'm very big on this. I've been reading, you know, the poor Charlie's Almanac, Charlie Munger, and he said in one of the um, things in their sayings, that he feels he's in the top 5% of people in the world that, that can, can look at what incentive, at incentives and see how they're going to play out and what the, what, the, what the circumstances are, what the incentives that are in place for that particular circumstance, and then tell you what the end game is. And I think that is so important that you're able to do that. What is the motivation when somebody is telling you something? What is the motivation that they have um, when you're just accepting the propaganda that's being put out on the news media? 
all of the information that I talk about, whether it's health wise on a disease that can't be mentioned, whether it is financial markets, this is all available to you. We are living in an age where you can find out anything you want if you want to find it out. One of the things you must do, though, to do that, and I've talked about that, reading books like The Art of Contrary Thinking, uh, other, other manuscripts and papers that I've presented to people on this calls, you have to relieve yourself of your biases. You have to look at things for what they are, not what you want them to be. If you're unable to do that, you are going to be going down the road. You're going to have a hard road to hoe. Blindly accepting what other people say is not the way to go through this life, and especially in this age now, where lying, deceit, propaganda, agate prop, everything is aligned against you because people are greedy. They want money and power. That's the way it's always been, but it's been it's it's like ramped up on steroids now, and some people just can't deal with that, so they just you know turn it out. You know, and, and unfortunately, a lot of people are sheep and they want to be led. They want to be told what to do. They want to told, be told it's okay because they don't want the burden of thinking for themselves and taking responsibility for themselves. That's just how it is. Okay, so, you know, the Fed didn't really do anything around interest rates. It didn't do anything around tapering, but just the mere utterances of Jay Powell tells you that the masters of universe still have a lot of influence. Um, this so-called Delta variant and a pause in global physical stimulus um, has created a soft patch in the reflation trade. We've seen, you know, uh, I don't think this is going to end as far as, you know, physical policy because these economies now in the West, especially that are so over indebted are basically have, have, are unable to respond to monetary policy that's exhausted itself. So now the shift has been, which I think is going to be a longer term shift to fiscal policy. Just keep giving money out, getting the money directly into the hands of people. So um, this Delta variant, uh, I'm not going to get into it. There's now data starting to come. We've seen data from Israel now. We've seen da data from the UK. Not John saying it, not some quack saying it. The data is coming in and it's starting to bother me. People are getting breakthrough cases of COVID and most of the hospitalizations and deaths are in people that have already been vaccinated. That's what the data is showing from Israel and the UK. It's out there if you want to find it. Okay? And this is exactly what we were kind of worried that's going to happen. Of course, you have the Biden administration saying it's because of unvaccinated people. Unvaccinated people are not, they're still getting COVID. You know, getting these things, these vaccinations doesn't keep you from not getting COVID. It was supposedly supposed to, to uh, be a case of you were going to have less symptoms and less chance of being hospitalized or dying. And now what we're seeing is that exactly what we thought could happen, some were theorizing, especially the people that spent their whole life studying this disease or studying mRNA serums that, that, that they were worried about. And it's starting to happen now. So watch the propaganda. Again, go look at the information yourself. It's out there on the internet. You can find it not me saying it, it's, it's there. And so, you know, we're already seeing people trying to lock down you know, in France, you know, and they're having riots in France. The yellow vests are back out now. You can go on the internet and find that. You're not going to see it on CNN. You're not going to see it on Fox. That's not the narrative. You know, everybody's supposed to go along with the program. They're not. They're tear gassing people. They're in the streets rioting about this. You know, people have had enough. The trust in governments is over. They've never been right about anything, ever. So this number three, I'm not really clear on, you know, I'm not going to talk about that, but, um, you know, investors subconsciously crave the safety of the old normal and discard the evidence for secular inflation. That's exactly right. We still don't know if this is going to be a secular inflation that lasts for a long time or if this is transitory, um, until that gets really figured out and the markets figure out which way it's going, I think you're going to have this volatility that we've been seeing. Here's the one that I really want to emphasize, and we'll talk about it more later on in the video. 
Energy and material stocks will provide a third of next year's earnings growth, despite accounting for only 5% of the market cap of the, of the stock market. And that's exactly true. Um, if you look at, I'm anticipating, we should start seeing over the next couple of weeks, earnings coming out from a lot of these companies. Um, and, you know, the second quarter, I mean, we had $4 copper pretty much the whole quarter. We had, you know, increasing oil prices over the quarter in the 60s and into the 70s, the entire quarter. This is going to mean tremendous cash flows and earnings for these companies. I mean, you've got, you know, this is what we talked about happening. Okay. And this will wake people up. And then if the sediment or if the view changes that, you know, $70 oil or above is here, that $4 copper and above is here is going to stay for a while. And people see the cash flows and earnings at some of these companies, the torque they have to these higher prices and commodities, then you'll see money move into these stocks. And if it doesn't, it goes back to Walter, what Walter Schloss said, one of my favorite value investors, you know, there's three things that uh, uh, can a company can do with its excess cash flows, right? It can uh, pay down debt, it can buy back stock or it can pay dividends. So um, expect to see that, you know, debt, paying down debt is accretive to you as an equity holder. Like I said before, as you pay down the debt in your home, your equity component, the equity in the home goes up, that's valuable to you. The same thing is going to happen in these stocks. And you've got a company like Suncor, who's buying back stock hand over fist. And I think you're going to see more companies do that as they get their, their, you know, the first objective will be to funnel cash into paying down debt. And that's accretive to us. And then you're going to see once they get uh, under their debt covenants or anything that precludes them, I think you'll sell, start seeing share buybacks being announced um, more and more. So, um, I don't think this is over. It's not a flash in the pan. Um, like I said, you have volatility, you have pullbacks, you have sediment changes. We'll see what happens. Um, I expect that uh, we'll have a reevaluation of things once we see these earnings come out in the next couple of weeks. So when we talk about the reflation trade, so everybody kind of focuses on like the CRB index and the CRB index is mostly influenced by oil. It has the largest component, but it's mostly full of commodities that are traded on futures exchanges. The CRB raw materials index is a index of raw materials that do not have futures contracts and are traded basically in cash markets. What am I talking about? Copper scrap, steel scrap, lead scrap, tallow, which is animal fats. Uh, paper scraps, um, uh, things like this. Uh, burlap is one. Um, you can go look it up, but it's things that these are markets. These are commodity markets for raw materials, but they're not necessarily, uh, they don't have a futures market. And what you can see here is look at this. This is nuts. What you're seeing here in this, um, you're back to highs that we haven't seen since the last commodity blow off. Uh, back in 2010, 11. And this thing's going straight up. It's not even pulling back. So, you know, a lot of people are fixating on lumber. Lumber has came down, you know, but lumber is a very illiquid market, very low um, cap market. And it's not, you know, it, it had a blow off and now it's pulling back, but that's not the case in all of the, in every commodity market. So, it, 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 this is where it comes into really paying attention to what's going on and really kind of deep diving things and seeing the whole picture, not just focusing on one or two little components. Now, am I starting to get into some confirmation bias? Possibly. Okay. But I'm acknowledging the fact that we could have, as I've said before, my thesis is inflation into the end of the year, then a period or close to the end of the year, period of deflation, a scare, and then they're going to come back at us with a, with even more, um, money printing, physical, poly, whatever, because they cannot let this thing go down. Uh, eventually, I think it gets away from them and blows up in their face, but that's, you know, months or years down the road, and we have to focus on what's happening right now and take the information as it is, process it, and adjust our probabilities and odds accordingly. So big bull on coal here, uh, you know, why? It's just interesting because 
I love this coal market because it's just setting up so perfectly. It's so obvious uh, for anybody that knows what's going on. Excuse me for a second. I had to take a drink of coffee. Um, China heat wave is pushing coal prices toward record level. A heat wave across some of China's biggest industrial provinces has pushed local electricity consumption to unprecedented levels, sending thermal coal futures towards record highs. The power load in the eastern province of Zhejiang near Shanghai surpassed 100 million kilowatts per hour on Tuesday for the first time, the state grid said. Usage has also hit records in nearby Jingzhou and southern region of Guangdong. The excessive demand boosted Chinese thermal coal futures to the highest in two months, briefly topping 900 yuan a ton in early trading. Futures have rallied more than 30% this year, reaching, record, reaching a record in May amid a supply shortage. And how exactly is this supply shortage going to get resolved? Because you have all the masters of the universe, you have all these governments around the world doing everything they can to constrict supply of fossil fuels. Yet the demand hasn't went away. Demand's inelastic. As a matter of fact, it's increasing when they have this heat wave in China. And so, you know, this is looking pretty good for the coal stocks that we have. Um, I'm feeling pretty good about it. I'll talk a little bit later about how we have our treasury secretary trying to constrict things even further. I'm going to uh, put a uh, link to a video with uh, Harris Kupperman when he was on the market huddle. And he was talking about how he thinks this is a concerted effort by the masters of the universe, the government in conjunction with large, you know, Larry Fink, people at Black, Black Rock and these people, you know, they're not going to try to just push this through by government legislation because they know they can't do it. So what they're going to do is try to do what they can to constrain the supply of fossil fuels, which will cause fossil fuel prices to go up. And then the free market will then obstens uh, ostensibly solve the renewable, the transition to clean energy itself. And this is what they do. I mean, the government knows, even currently right now, or this regime administration, they don't have the votes in the Senate to get most of their things through. So they're, you know, they're, they're working with private industry. The co corporations are, you know, we have this fascistic uh, setup now where corporations have uh, inculcated themselves and aligned themselves with the state, and they're carrying out the state's edicts. You see it in the censorship of the social media giants. You see it where companies are now making people get vaccinated as a condition of employment. So the government doesn't have to pass any laws. They'll just have the corporations who are in bed with them do their bidding for them. It's the same thing on renewable energy. You know, they're spending $600 billion a year around the world and growing on this transition to renewable energy. And so people like at BlackRock and these other masters of the universe who are all in New York and Washington with, the, with all these uh, bureaucrats and politicians, you know, they take a position and then they're going to push us towards it and they're going to reap this windfall. I mean, it's so obvious to see. And like I said before, well, that's a conspiracy theory. Yeah, because people in power and who are wealthy don't conspire with each other to get more wealth and more power. Yeah, I'm the one that uh, that's a conspiracy theory. That should be obvious. That's human nature. That's just how it is. That's the way it's always been. So anyways, we're seeing, uh, but you know, not everybody's going to play along, right? Um, most of the world population is not located under the control of the masters of the universe. Yeah, they could control Europe and North America and the Anglophone countries, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan a little bit's involved with that. But, you know, Russia, China, India, a lot of the emerging markets aren't going to play the game. They have an obligation. Their political survival, their um, ability to continue uh, their regimes and to stay in power is incumbent upon them growing the economy and making people's standard of living go up. And to, to have increased GDP, to have increased standard of living requires more and more energy. It ain't going to happen with windmills and solar panels. So nuclear is going to be a component. Fossil fuels are going to be a component. Coal is going to be a component. Yes, renewables will be in the mix too. But uh, to get, you know, to, to be a legitimate regime, to stay in power, you can't go backwards. And that's what they're asking people to do. They want you know, the IEA and all these things have said, well, when you meet the carbon goals, we have to not only, you know, we have to reduce consumption of energy over the next 30 years, reduce it massively to meet the goals. That's not going to happen. There's no precedent for this ever happening. 
And so uh, this is going to cause a major conflict as we go forward be between the haves and the have nots. People in the West, the wealthy countries that have, that are going in this direction because they are being pushed this way by this state incorporation fascistic uh, regime uh, that wants to gain more power and wealth. Uh, and these uh, emerging and frontier markets that are trying to better the standard of living for their people. Now, I'm not saying that the leaders of these countries in the developing markets are like angels either, but if they want to stay in power, that's, that's, the, that's the bargain they've made with their people. You put up with, you know, in communist China, you put up with the CCP, and the bargain is, is that your standard of living goes up over time. That's the bargain. So they have to do that. That's keeps the, the regime legitimate. So I expect that as these other countries don't comply, that this is going to cause um, conflict between us and them in the, in the relatively near future. You're already seeing people talking about putting tariffs and other taxes and things on stuff that comes from countries where they don't have proper, you know, environmental and labor uh, practices. I mean, we've talked about what's going on in Western China, and uh, we're already seeing the Justice Department talking about, you know, if you do, if you source, if you source materials for there for your projects from that area where they are saying that there's a genocide going on in slave labor, that that could be a criminal offense. Uh, I saw uh, some article about that this week. So this is a developing situation. It, that certainly won't be deflationary, I can tell you that. So you have a lot of things, a lot of plates in there, a lot of things to think about. Uh, but what we're seeing right now is so far so good with coal. Um, here's just another tweet. Uh, I like to put this on here. Coal keeps the lights on. This is why people burn coal. IEA on coal, the IEA's roadmap for a net zero emissions by 2050 calls for a 6% decline in coal-fired generation annually, yet coal will grow by almost 5% next year and another 3% in 2023, hitting a new peak. So uh, at least for the next couple of years, coal ain't going anywhere, and it represents a tremendous uh, opportunity for uh, investment and speculation. So I thought this was an interesting slide. Picked this up uh, off Trader Ferg's um, feed. This is the uh, forecasts on the right, seven of them on energy transitions. These are all, you know, very smart people, uh, you know, intergovernmental panel on climate change, Clinton presidential advisory panel, uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, Google 2030. These are all the people that are, all have PhDs. You need to listen to them because science and their PhD and you high school graduate. Well, here is the actual share of renewable energy, of US primary energy, and here were their forecasts. Like I said, they ain't ever been right about anything, ever. But you keep listening to them. So, you know, it's these maybe the retort would be, well, they were overly ambitious because they wanted to move the Overton window and create the conversation, and we are slowly but surely. Bakalov Schmiel, you have to just li listen to his videos. He, t he talks about, he's, that's what he does. He studies energy transitions. They take decades, they take generations. It's just that simple. Um, crude oil inventories are plunging. We're back to the pre, inventories are back to pre-COVID uh, um, levels and still continuing down. What does that mean? U.S. commercial crude stockpiles are now back to pre-pandemic levels, lowest since January 2020. On a four-week average, U.S. crude oil stocks are falling at a 1.2 billion barrel per day. That's per, uh, per week, which is the fastest, largest rate in 40 years of data. So we have these big pulls on crude inventories, and we're not seeing the ability to replenish them as of yet. You know, we had the little pullback in crude prices this week because of more of the OPEC, UA. E, Saudi Arabia thing. But, you know, the crude draws continue. Uh, we'll have some bumpy traffic here with the um, Delta variant now and various countries going to try to lock down again, uh, I suspect. But, uh, you know, we'll have to watch that. I mean, if that blows up, it has the potential to blow up. I mean, if we have this situation now where we have all these people 
in some countries, 50, 70, 80 percent of people vaccinated. And all of a sudden now these people are, you know, getting sick with COVID and, 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 and we're, you know, they're the ones and we're going to have increased hospitalizations again. What does that portend? I mean, more to come on that, right? We don't know. It's something to keep it. You know, if everybody goes back into lockdown again, which is what some people have forecasted that are called conspiracy theorists, it's just going to be a never ending cycle of lockdowns, reopenings, booster shots, propaganda, bullshit, and, uh, you know, until people get sick of it. So we'll have to see, right? We don't know. We don't know the future. All we can do is look at the current data and try to f make sense of it, which is very difficult these times because you don't know who to trust. And there's so many people that are just out there lying and doing things for, uh, you know, nefarious reasons. So this is another reason why I'm bullish long term on energy on fossil or hydrocarbons. You have to be. Yellen Strong, she's a she was Secretary of Treasury. So the United States government is one of the largest, you know, shareholders and contributors to these World Bank and all these things. And so what did what did Secretary Yellen say? Signaled she will push multilateral development banks like the World Bank and things further away from fossil fuel projects, saying she would ask them to increase their climate ambition to support the Paris Agreement on Carbon Emission Reductions. Quote, I plan to shortly convene the heads of the uh, major development banks to articulate our expectations that they align their portfolios with the Paris Climate, Paris Agreement and net zero goals as urgently as possible. Yellen wields significant influence over the development lenders as Treasury manages substantial U.S. shareholdings in the institutions. So they're pulling all the levers now. But it's funny, though, because you have Biden out. <laughs> These people are ridiculous. He's out talking about, well, we need our partners in the Middle East to pump more oil because gas prices are too high. I mean, you can't make it up. I mean, I, I don't know, you know. And that's political, right? I mean, if, if, if oil goes to $100 a barrel by the time the congressional elections come up, the Democrats are going to get swept from power. I mean, people ain't going to pay $5. Like I said, you can stand outside a grocery store or go to the ga gas station with a clipboard interview people. Are you for clean energy? Oh, yes, absolutely. Clean energy, clean air, clean water. They're for it. Well, if that means you have to pay 6 $7 a gallon for gasoline, well, their, their eyes will blow out of their head. What are you talking about? You're nuts. So what they're trying to do here and what is going to end up happening in the reality uh, ain't going to match. And so it's going to be interesting to watch, but I would suggest to you that it's going to, for people that actually can see what's going on and can navigate this, I mean, they're doing everything they can, right? They cut the pipelines, no more drilling on federal lands. They're going to tell the development banks no more uh, this affects a lot of emerging and, and, and developing countries that have resources. Uh, don't develop, don't loan them money to develop these resources. So who will step into the void? Nature abhors a void. Those things are still going to get developed if they're needed, but the Chinese will step in. The Russians will step in. The Indians will step in. They have money too. They need the resources. They'll step in. And so that's going to create, like I said before, even more conflict because why aren't they going along with the program? And I've pointed out to you before, I've quoted officials from these countries. We have the right to develop just like you did, and we're going to do it. And we're going to use fossil fuels to do it because that is the cheapest, quickest way to do it. And so I would think if they're going to continue to push this narrative in Washington and in Brussels and other places like this, that this is going to lead to a conflict at some point. So... Uh, like I said, uh, be watching the earnings this week. Watch the announcements that they make in their conference calls. I'm talking about the oil companies. Uh, we have, I'm expecting some really good things over the next few weeks. See if we start seeing debt announcements of more debt paydowns, more stock buybacks, dividend increases. That's the kind of things we're going to want to be seeing. So, uh, you know, we'll be reporting it uh, from here at uh, Actionable Intelligence Alert. All right, guys. Uh, that's it for this week. Uh, appreciate the support. Look forward to seeing you in the comments and we'll talk to you next week.